Welcome to Crop Scheduling of Bedding Plants. My name is Heidi Walliger. I am a Greenhouse and Nursery Extension Educator with Michigan State University. This webinar was recorded in front of a live audience and then optimized for your viewing online. This program offered by MSU Extension is open to all. If you need any additional accommodations to watch this webinar, please contact me by my email listed on the screen. Now, I would like to introduce Dr. Eric Runkel, Professor of Horticulture and Extension Specialist with Michigan State University. So we're going to talk about crop scheduling and what factors you can manipulate as well as there will certainly be things that you can't. So one of the things we'll talk about is what's possible and, and also what's not. So when we look at factors that can influence flowering of bedding plants, and one of the key words I would say is can, because they don't all apply to bedding plants, um, would be the size of the starting material, the liner environment or the plug environment, especially if it received high light or low light, and especially if it received an inductive photo period, if it has a, a, a photoperiodic response. The day length and lighting is one way that we use to promote flowering, uh, such as of petunias. The quantity of light, which has a bigger effect when we're finishing these in early spring, late winter, early spring, light quantity is a bigger deal because we're really in a light limiting situation. Come 1st of April, the days are naturally long. We're getting light levels high outside that really any sort of lighting strategy wouldn't have much of an effect on flowering time, with, with a few exceptions. Uh, if we're looking at all the factors that we can use to regulate flowering and scheduling, temperature is number one. That's our accelerator of our car. That's what drives how fast we go in our car. Um, the cooler the temperature, the slower plants develop, and vice versa with warm temperatures. Um, and then last but not least, PGRs, if they're uh, late applications or corrective applications, what I would consider to be applications that are made that are reactive, you know, things are already getting to be too big, I've got to do something to sit on them, that's when we can start delaying flowering, which sometimes is desirable, but other times it's not. So I'll talk a little bit about these, but spend more time on uh, light and temperature, because those are our two biggest factors that we are manipulating. Certainly the size of the starting material has an effect on finish time. So when we do research at Michigan State, um, with young plants or finished plants, it's rare when we apply a PGR. And we do that because of the potential to delay flowering. So even though these plugs look a little bit elongated or quite a bit elongated, um, that's intentional. So one of the things we've quantified is crop timing from a 288 cell versus a 128, or sometimes we looked at 128s versus 50s or, or different things, just to see if indeed a larger cell plug flower earlier or not. So I'm just going to give you a, an example here with Snapdragon. Um, those from 288 cell plug trays had an average of, of six leaves at transplant. Those from the larger cell had nine leaves. And the question is, are they going to flower faster from a nine leaf plug? We would think so, but it's good to see. So we transplanted those into common environments, in this case either at a constant 63 or 73 degrees Fahrenheit, and we simply recorded days to flower after transplant. From a 63, uh, at a 63 degree temperature average, uh, you can see that uh, flowering time was about eight days quicker when it came from a 128 versus a 288. So what do you think, wh how would the values compare if we're instead of growing these at 73 instead of 63? Similar flowering time, faster, slower? A little bit faster so the bars will be shorter, right? Our days of flower, so indeed, um, actually quite significantly by growing plants at 10 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So, so um, certainly there's a plug effect that persists even growing warm, but also note that you get the fastest flowering starting with a large plug and growing at a warmer temperature. Again, that's probably not too surprising, but if you look at the numbers here, you know, this is finishing in about 35 days, large plug, warm temperature versus a small plug, cool temperature you're at about 35 days. So that's about a 20 day delay in flowering. Or you could look at it conversely as you're accelerating flowering by about three weeks with this combination. <coughs> we also looked at counting leaf numbers, um, 63. Uh, they did develop a few more leaves uh, from the 288 versus the 128 before flowering, whereas there was really no effect um, 
And the, the, the take home message here is what we see representatively is that plants pretty much will finish with the same number of leaves, whether they started from a young plant or, or a, lar uh, a small young plant or a large young plant. So if you get those leaves on earlier, you have the opportunity to grow these plants at a relatively high density um, and still um, get relatively quick flowering. The total production time is similar, in other words. OK, um, our days are slowly getting longer. But a lot of these young plants are being produced uh, when the days are short, as well as you're transplanting now when the days are still short. So what we have here is a map of the change to the biological photo period, which would be the natural photo period. This is roughly 30 to 40 minutes longer than sunrise to sunset. So just like people, we can perceive light outside before sunrise, and it's still light outside after sunset. Plants can also perceive that, and it's roughly 30 to 40 minutes longer than sunrise to sunset. So we're close to about 40 degrees latitude here in Kalamazoo. And you can see that that's the medium line. This is a red line. And our shortest days are about 10 hours. They're increasing, and our longest days are about 15 and a half hours. So we have a lot of bedding plants that have a long day response, and the question is, when do long days begin naturally? So first of all, what is a long day? How many hours does it take before a long day begins? Some people would say maybe intuitively a long day is anything more than 12. And that's generally not true. Uh, if we look at uh, some plants, like some of the petunias, long day can begin around 13 hours. But if we're looking at a wide range of bedding plants, we typically pick 14 hours as a day that's long enough to guarantee that we're getting a long day response. So when do we get 14 hours? Uh, you can follow the line over, getting ahead of myself here a little bit, uh, follow the line over here, and that's not until about the middle part of April. So for some crops, there's a benefit of providing low-intensity long-day lighting. There are lots of ways to do that that I'll talk about here in a minute, but the benefit it goes on until sometime in the first part, first to middle part of April. And what is a short day? Uh, that also will vary from one crop, but typically if we're looking at a broad variety of, of floriculture crops with a short day response, we see anything about 12 hours or less. So we still have uh, short days now, but that's going to be cutting off here about the end of February or 1st of March. OK, so when we look at bedding plants, since we're focusing on bedding plants, but this would also apply to herbaceous perennials, most plants will fit into one of th uh, three categories. There are a handful of day neutral plants in which photo period does not influence flowering. So you can grow them under lights, you can grow them under without lights. The flowering time is not going to be influenced by that photo period. There are some crops that are short day plants that will flower faster or in a just a few cases, short days are required for flowering. And then we have a lot of bedding plants that are long day plants in which flowering only occurs or is faster under a long day. It's actually the duration of the darkness or the period of darkness that influences whether a long day plant flowers or not. Same with a short day plant. You need a long uninterrupted night for the plant to flower or to flower faster. So I'll go through some examples of each of these different responses. Um, cosmos will vary. There are some with more photoperiodic responses than others. But this Sonata Pink is an example of a cultivar that has a pretty strong short day response. So this is 29 days to flower from a tiny seedling. Uh, this is some work that Ryan Warner did at Michigan State uh, several years ago. And this is 28, 29 days to flower under a nine hour short day at about 68 degrees day night temperature. At the same temperature, same transplant date, everything is the same except this was provided with four hours uh, as night interruptions. We have a long day. And you can see it took uh, over twice as long for that plant to flower. Now. Early flowering is not always desirable. When may you not want to have early flowering? OK, so you might not want it in flower too early. In the plug tray. In the plug tray or it's probably more uncommon now than it used to be. Uh, but you might get in like a tray of celosia and they already have flower buds on them. Um, so if the plants are induced too early, you can get a really small plant with a small flower on it, and it's not able to fill up the container before it's ready to ship. So there are some growers who will um, either during the plug stage or for the first week or two after transplant, 
is they'll grow them under a long day, in this case, to get some vegetative growth and then start the short days to get more rapid flowering. So that would be a way to try to optimize the size for the pot. Now if you're producing these in tiny cell packs, you probably don't need to go to that step of, of trying to have a, um, a, a bigger plant. The other thing is, is that if you're finishing these cosmos under long days later in the spring, you can see you also have not only delayed flowering, but you have a pretty tall plant. So a way to produce plants not only quicker but shorter would be to give them some short days. Then we have lots of examples of uh, long day plants. These are petunias are mostly facultative long days, meaning they will flower under short days, but flowering occurs faster under long days. So again, everything is the same except under long days, these plants flowered uh, about three weeks quicker uh, than those under short days. <clears throat> and then we have some more dramatic examples. Under short days, Rebecca's remain basically permanently vegetative and they will not flower unless they're given a long day. And there are some examples of those, uh, including uh, all the Rebecca's that we have studied. So this is a, just a starting list of plants, uh, common bedding plants and what category of photo period they fall in. We have some short day plants and some fairly common ones. Most of these are facultative short day, meaning they will flower faster under short days, but they will flower under long days. So things like African marigold, celosias, cosmos, dahlias, you can see uh, some pretty common ones. Sometimes the flowering is about a week quicker. Sometimes it's only maybe five days quicker. In other cases, it can be a couple weeks quicker. Then we have the long day responses, the facultative ones, meaning they will flower under short days, but they're faster under long days. Things like ageratum, calabacoa, many of them have a long day response. Uh, dianthus, pansies, most petunias, uh, and some verbenas. And then you have a list of obligate long day plants. Uh, some of the fuchsias, some of the blue lobelia, um, some of the wave petunias, especially like the wave purple classic and the wave purple improved, they may flower after three months under a short day, but the flowering really for, flower, for production purposes really needs to have a long day for flowering. So it's always a challenge putting these lists together because breeders have been working to change the photo period response for a lot of these. So just because it's up here doesn't necessarily mean that all varieties fit under that category. There are becoming more and more exceptions to these rules. So how do you provide long days? There are lots of ways to do it. Uh, it used to be until a couple years ago that my number one question was on PGRs, and now the number one question is on lighting. I get a lot of questions still because there's so many different things that you can do with lighting and, and uh, ways to deliver it and spectrum and intensity, things that will have an effect on flowering and, and crop growth. So just some general guidelines if we're looking at long day lighting. So this is when we're interested in delivering a low intensity light to manipulate the flowering process. So the guideline would be to operate lamps until at least the 1st of April. Uh, by then, for most crops, the days are naturally long. Now there are, are some exceptions like some of the campanulas that need at least a 15 hour day to flower. But for bedding plants, uh, I don't know of an example that needs a long day, a day longer than 14 hours. This can be accomplished either by extending the day, so you can have day extension lighting, or providing the traditional four hour night interruption lighting, such as from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. Uh, we've done some comparisons between day extension and night interruption. They're pretty much identical in terms of response. So if you're limited to electricity, you can say, well, I'm gonna operate these ranges with day extension, and then these other ranges at night interruption, and at least in theory, they should flower at the same time if the other factors are the same. Then there's the concept of operating lights intermittently using some sort of cyclic lighting strategy. And so instead of turning the lights on continuously for four hours, you would uh, have that light on for just a period of that time. So one strategy is to turn lamps on for 10 minutes every half hour for that four hour period. And that's a way to save energy. Now that's a strategy you can use for incandescence or with LEDs, but it's probably not appropriate for compact fluorescence or things like high pressure sodium. And the reason is, is that fluorescence and sodium lamps, their bulb life is negatively influenced by the on and off cycles. You don't want to turn those on and off uh, numerously. 
So LEDs are one of the nice things about them is that their on off, uh, their longevity is not influenced by on off cycles. So uh, incandescent lamps that work alone by themselves, of course, they are being phased out of production and they're also energy uh, inefficient. And so several years ago, we did research and I've talked about it here before showing how if you switch over completely over to compact fluorescent, the spectrum from compact fluorescent isn't as effective as the incandescents or some of the LEDs. But if you combine the two lamp types and do an every other bulb of fluorescence and incandescence, you can get a good crop response. And so alternating them is an effective strategy. LEDs are generally effective. Now, there are lots of different LED products out there. These I'm talking about LEDs that are specifically made for horticultural applications. So if you went out and you bought a, like a white LED at a Home Depot, that spectrum is going to be very similar to a compact fluorescent. And so there are some crops like petunias, dianthus, calabacoa, uh, ageratum, snapdragon. The flowering of those would be delayed under a white LED compared to a LED that's made for uh, floriculture. So there are a couple products out there at least um, that are made specifically to regulate flowering. Uh, there's one that's by Philips. They have a deep red, white, and far red LED. And then there's one by the, the Total Grow uh, folks at Venice. Um, they also have a lamp that has a lot of red and some far red to regulate flowering. Another strategy is the beam flicker. Um, you guys probably are familiar with those. A lot of growers will have them or have used them. And I'll show a picture of that here in a minute. And then also some growers are doing their own trials or have experimented with boom lighting, the concept of putting generally high intensity lighting on an irrigation boom and then having that boom go back and forth at night for a period of four to six hours. Let's talk a little bit about these. Um, one of our major projects the last four or five years has been looking at developing information so that we get an effective LED to regulate flowering. So before, when we started this project, there were no commercially available LEDs specifically for flowering applications. So we did the research with the goal of, okay, what's the most effective spectrum so that when the manufacturers came out, we would know it, uh, it would be a, a desirable lamp. Fast forward to a couple years ago, we came up with some data that showed really this is an effective spectrum. And that was about the same time that Philips came out with their flowering lamps. Philips has three different flowering lamps, but there's one specifically that I recommend for flowering, and that's the one that's deep red, white, deep red, white, and far red. They have a lamp that is only far red, which I don't think would have any effects, and then they have a lamp that is just the red and white without the far red. And long story short, when we're in light limiting conditions like we are in Michigan, the red and white alone without the far red is not as effective as the one with far red. We did a lot of trials a couple years ago uh, at growers in Michigan as well as in Indiana, New Jersey, and California comparing um, lighting with their traditional lamps, and in most cases at that time it was with incandescence, versus this deep red, white, far red LED. And then we had a short day control with, with crops not lighted. So you can see in this case the flowering time of ageratum at an average of 68 degrees Fahrenheit was essentially the same under incandescence or the deep red, white, far red LEDs. And that's not surprising because the red to far red ratio of these LEDs is similar to incandescence. So we see similar resu results here with Petunia, the Easy Wave Burgundy Star, you can see flowering time was identical. We did do a study comparing the deep red, white, far red LEDs with the ones without the far red. There were a few crops in which flowering was the same, but then there were other crops like petunias and calabacoas in which flowering was delayed without that far red. Then this is another alternative that uh, seems to work fairly well. Um, beam flicker, this is a 400, 600, or 1,000 watt high pressure sodium lamp that's mounted uh, generally fairly high up. And then there's that reflector that moves back and forth to the crops below. So when this fixture came out, one of the questions was, how big of an area can you light for each device? And so we worked with uh, Parsource at the time to do some research to quantify how far does that light cast to, to influence a crop. 
and to boil down a couple experiments by my former graduate student, Matt Blanchard, into a simple slide. Uh, this is a representative example of the effects of different distances from that beam flicker. So we used a 600 watt fixture. So if you used a 400 watt or a 1,000 watt, you'd have to consider that with these distances. Um, but we grew them either under a nine hour short day on the far left. Uh, this NF means the plants did not flower. It's an obligate long day plant or we grew them under continuous light for four hours or for 20% of the time for that four hour period under incandescent lamps. Because the flowering time was the quickest under the continuous four hour night interruption lighting, um, we made flowering time relative to that. And then we had the beam flicker and different horizontal distances from underneath the lamp. As you can see in the numbers, that flowering time was relatively similar up to somewhere around 33 to 43 feet. And then beyond that, the flowering time became progressively delayed. And this is just one example. As I said, we looked at probably 12 or 15 different crops. But if we're going to make a recommendation, we could say you can probably get about 35 feet away from the beam flicker on each side of that to light the area. So roughly one 600 watt beam flicker could cover about 70 feet of area. Um, some growers have reported that they get a little bit of delayed flowering as they get further away from the beam flicker. And that's not too surprising because you tend to see a little bit of a delay as you get towards the edges. Okay, so let's talk then about light integrals. This is the total quantity of light delivered to plants. This also can affect scheduling time. And this is one of the reasons why crops scheduled later in the year flower faster than crops that are finished early in the year. So light integral is the total amount of photosynthetic light that is per, uh, received per square meter each day. It's an accumulation measurement, so it's not something you can go out with a light sensor, measure it, and say this is my DLI. It's something that you need a sensor that's going to be recording data throughout the day. It then integrates that data and it gives you moles per day. So the analogy would be like a rain gauge where you're counting how many photons or particles of light are striking a square meter, which is about 11 square feet and how much of that is accumulating over a 24-hour day. And the question is, when do you get, when are we in light limiting situations? And when do you get the most benefit of supplemental lighting? So Jim Faust at Clemson University developed these lighting maps, and then I adapted them based upon when floriculture crops have relative value to the, when the lighting of floriculture crops is relatively valuable. So this is the relative value of supplemental lighting in the month of December. You can see most of the country there's a large value or a high value, as well as most of uh, the country in January. In February, the northern half to third, there's still strong value of supplemental lighting. Once you get to March, though, there's little or no value in most of the U.S., except for those of us in the Great Lakes and the Pacific Northwest, where there's still some moderate value. And that's because we have the days that are still relatively cloudy. We're still getting some lake effect. Uh, and so the potential to accelerate flowering is still uh, somewhat valuable from lamps. Once you get to about April, you might as well unplug all your lights because the value to a floriculture crop really is, is not there. It's not worth the money to run the lights. <coughs> so uh, some growers will um, play with the lighting, either the light integral or the photo period, and they will actually try to induce the plugs so that the plug is induced when they transplant it to try to even accelerate flowering more. Um, so with short day plants, you know, it's a lot easier to provide a short day to plugs than it is finished plants because you can provide it to a relatively small, uh, in a relatively small area. So we're naturally getting short days. So if you have a short day plant this time of year and you're trying to finish it early, this would be a crop you do not want to provide supplemental lighting to. That may be difficult because a lot of you will be doing lighting of all your plugs, so this would require you to be pulling out like a black cloth over the crops each day, so they're not getting more than about 12 hours of light. Short day plants though, by providing as little as seven to 10 days, is often adequate to induce early flowering of these crops. So it's not like they need to perceive short days the entire time. It's just enough to get the first initiation. Um, they're also relatively sensitive um, at an early stage, and a lot of plants will start to begin to perceive short days when they only have about two to four leaves. So maybe a 512 wouldn't be the best use for a short day induction, but maybe something like a 288 or especially a larger one would be. 
Long day plants uh, typically need a longer period of time to induce, and they also need to be a little more mature than short day plants. So it does vary from crop to crop, but once they get about four to six leaves, and if you give them two to three weeks, that's sufficient to induce flowering. Now a question came up, and we've seen this before. Um, it tends to happen on some of the wave petunias where you get a lighted plug, it was relatively mature, and it was induced to flower in the plug tray. That's, let's say that's transplanted uh, February, okay, for maybe first of April sales. Uh, what has happened, and it's happened quite often actually, is that you take the induced plug, you transplant it, and it'll throw that flower bud out, and it'll have one or two flowers, but then all the laterals that are coming off are vegetative. So some of these plants that have a pretty strong photoperiodic response, like some of the wave petunias, it's important that not only is the plug induced, but it's then continued to be induced that the laterals and new flower buds continue to develop. So if you see this kind of like early flowering that's not desirable, that's because the plugs were induced to flower and then a uh, long day was then not provided during the finish stage. I know that Pan American has been working with growers to try to help growers understand what's going on. <clears throat> there are some day neutral plants in which um, light is being manipulated for early flowering. Um, in fact, sometimes seed impatiens, uh, they can flower really early under high light, which is sometimes not desirable. So some growers will actually, maybe not in Michigan, but further south, provide some shade to delay that early flowering. So these are all things that, that growers can do to manipulate scheduling time. If you're not growing the plugs yourself, then it's important to know what your plug producer is doing so that you can anticipate what they're doing and how that can affect your scheduling. Um, I'll go through this sl slide very briefly. because So he asked me the question, okay, I've got only, I'm, you know, I've only got a certain number of lights under which plants, at what stage of production do I get my most benefit? You know, do I light early in the plug stage, toward the middle, or toward the end? And I didn't really have an answer, so we did a study to try to answer that. So we did it with Petunia and, and Pansy and a couple others. This is just a take-home message slide, but we grew them under um, long days, either at a low intensity, so this would be like incandescent lighting intensity, or high intensity uh, from high-pressure sodium lamps. We grew the plugs under constant low intensity, or high intensity during the first third, middle third, or last third, or during the first two thirds or last two thirds, or continuously the entire time. So what it, this slide tells you, <laughs> kind of, is that first of all, the more light the better, which is probably not too surprising. Uh, we did this experiment twice. Once was uh, late winter, early spring. The second one was mid-spring. So we had really low light, light levels the first time. Um, and this is a photograph from the first uh, replication. So certainly these plants that received more light, the plug was pullable earlier, had a better rel developed root system. If you could light, let's say your range had two-thirds of the range was lit, the value was certainly the first, excuse me, the last two-thirds was more beneficial than just the first two-thirds. And you can see that here by the differences in rooting. But if you could only light one-third, we saw that the value was greatest during the last third of production. And that's maybe not too surprising because the older the plant, the more leaves you have to capture and utilize the light. In fact, if we only look at lighting that first third, there was very little of benefit, if any. And so you are maybe having a slightly warmer media because you are increasing the temperature of the root zone, but I don't think I would use lights to accomplish that. We then took those plants out and finished them. Um, and to look at whether there was a benefit of taking this crop and transplanting it versus an unlighted crop. Um, I will say that when we look at uh, the greatest value of supplemental lighting, just to summarize, it's greater uh, during the latter production stages. So is there a carryover effect? So if you take a plug from a, a lighted grower versus one that is not lighting, what's the effect on flowering time? So as I said, we did this twice. Here we have flowering time under a moderate light integral, moderately low to moderately high. And as we can see, the more light we provided, the faster those plants subsequently flowered. It's not a big number, but you know, roughly four to five to six days faster 
from a lighted plug that was not. So some growers over the years have gone from basically completely unlighted plugs to lighting almost all their plugs. And when they first made that jump, they were a little surprised to see their flowering was one to sometimes two weeks quicker by lighting their plugs versus not before. So it can have a significant impact. If you choose to buy your plugs and you're getting them from a, a, a lighted grower, and for whatever reason, the next year you get them from someone who's not lighting, that means you need to add production time onto it. Okay. We saw similar results again when we did the experiment the second time, but because it was uh, higher light levels, you can see we had faster flowering all around. We've done a lot of work quantifying plant responses to temperature as well as light integral. Uh, I'll talk about temperature here in a minute, but what I want to illustrate here is the effect of light on flowering time. So this is geranium grown at constant temperatures from 63 to 79, and we have days to first flower under an average DLI of five moles, and we're certainly in a light limiting condition when we only get five moles of light. We also grew the plants under, in this case, 12 moles. 12 moles would be what we consider to be our target DLI. 12 or more would be what our target would be. That's not always easy to get there, um, but you can see how just increasing the light integral without increasing temperature, how much of an effect that had on flowering time. Now geranium is particularly sensitive to light integral, but you can see at 63 degrees Fahrenheit, plants flowered three weeks earlier at that same temperature, just with two and a half times more light. We still saw acceleration of flowering at the warmest temperatures, but the magnitude was a little bit smaller. So what we've been doing is over the years been generating this data because every crop has its own nuances in terms of how light and temperature influence the finished crop. Okay, so switching into temperature, we've already talked about how the rate influences flowering time. That's our, the biggest thing we can do to address crop timing and scheduling. Having said that, uh, one of the things that we could easily ignore is the effect on quality. And whenever we're making changes to light or especially temperature, we're thinking about not only the timing of the crop, but how might that imp impact the quality. So um, we can get our fastest flowering at the warmest temperatures here with geranium, but when they actually flower, what you might find is the flowers at the warmest temperatures are smaller. The color isn't quite as vivid. They might have not quite as many flower buds on them. Okay, so you, then you have to weigh the trade-off between is your quality sufficient versus the fastest flowering. If you are in a situation where you are trying to produce a premium product, something that was somehow distinguishable from competition, how do you achieve a higher quality? There are lots of things you could do, but one would be to give more light, more space to the crop, grow them cooler. Those are three things you could do to produce, produce a higher quality. Having said that, all three of those cost money. So you'd have to be able to get a higher price to be able to justify doing one of those three. So we, can, we cannot forget when we're changing temperature the potential effects on the quality. Um, also can influence the branching and the stem thickness. Uh, and then temperature can also influence height and some growers will use a cooler day than night to create a negative diff and produce more compact plants. But that also can cost money because most of the heat in a greenhouse occurs at night. So if you're, if you're growing crops at a uh, warmer night than day, you're gonna be consuming more energy. Okay, so talking about temperature, let's first understand some of the fundamentals of how plants respond to temperature. So I'm gonna talk about, first of all, the base temperature, which is the temperature below which plant development stops. So in other words, at such a cool temperature, you grow it, the plant's just gonna sit there and not develop. It's not gonna put out new leaves or it's not ever gonna flower. And then we have kind of the opposite, which is the optimum temperature, which is the temperature at which plant rate is the most rapid meaning the plant is growing as fast as it can. It's like if you have the accelerator on your car, you're flooring it. It's, it your car is going as fast as it can. Of course, if you do it too long, at some point, there might be some repercussions to your car. <clears throat> Note, though, that this is not necessarily the best temperature. The plant's developing rapidly, but it may not produce the highest quality plant. And in fact, in many cases, it won't. 
So what we'll do is we'll draw a graph of how temperature influences the development rate. So zero would mean that the plant is not developing at all, and then we have some maximum where the plant's developing as fast as it can. So let's look at an example of uh, a crop that is cold tolerant. This is Snapdragon. It's an example where the base temperature is quite low, in this case about 35 degrees Fahrenheit. As you increase temperature beyond that, the rate of development increases pretty much linearly until you reach some temperature beyond which the rate of development actually begins to slow down. In fact, if you grew Snapdragon at 87 degrees Fahrenheit, it might initially develop, but after a period of time, it's basically going to peter out. It's going to be growing so fast that it can't sustain itself. Then we uh, collected other data, but in this case with Pentus. So this is a crop that is considered cold sensitive. You can see it has a higher base temperature, close to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. It also has a higher optimum temperature, um, and then it also can tolerate warm temperatures a little bit better. So we call these the base temperatures, and we categorize crops based on their base temperatures. And then we have these optimum temperatures. So this sort of data can be useful because a lot of time, I shouldn't say a lot of times, sometimes you're in a situation where you need to hold crops, or other times you're in a situation where you need to get color on them fast. Okay? So if you want to hold crops, you want to be close to the base temperatures of these plants because that's basically shutting them down. That's like taking your foot off the accelerator in a car. You probably, though, don't want to be below the base temperatures. So something like a penis, you don't want to expose it to 41 because it's certainly not going to be growing, and over a period of time it might get some chilling injury. But even going down to um, you know, high 30s for these cold tolerant crops and low 50s for these cold sensitives will really put the brakes on them. Likewise, the optimum temperatures can be good to know because if you need to put color on a plant, this is as warm as you can go. And if you go too warm, you're going to start having a negative effect because the development rate generally falls off quite quickly. Um, one more thing about if you're having to adjust scheduling of crops is that, generally speaking, it's better to raise the day temperature more than the night temperature. And the reason is, is what happens at night is plants are respiring. They're using a lot of energy to continue to maintain themselves. So if you need to push the crops, you might be able to go even beyond optimum temperature during the day, but then compensate by cooling them off at night so they don't respire as much. So we've developed these curves for lots of different crops. Um, this is for Angelonia, just an example. Base temperature is quite high. I use this as an example because a couple years ago, there were a lot of Angelonias that weren't in flower on time. And I think it was because growers were growing them a little bit too cool. So they don't start to develop until at least 50. Optimum temperature is around 80. Uh, and then beyond that, they tolerate, though, um, more te warm temperatures quite well. We do, the, do these experiments uh, mostly in greenhouses, but we've done some, some of them in growth chambers. Uh, here's a photo from a uh, former graduate student, Matt Blanchard, who did this study, growing these at constant temperatures all the way from 41 to 86. You can see the dramatic effect of temperature on the flowering time here. In fact, at 50 and below, the crops didn't tolerate for extended periods of time. 59, the plants flowered in about 60 days. In increasing only to 68, you can see a huge influence on accelerating flowering. However, that extra bump, um, nine more degrees, only accelerated flowering by about five days. So these, these crops that have a high base temperature um, growing in the high 60s to low 70s, you get most of your benefit. Warmer than that, you can bump up flowering, but not by a lot. And then just another example here with Cosmos. Uh, again, this crop didn't do well at the coolest temperatures. It did eventually flower at 50 degrees Fahrenheit, but you can see it was very slow compared to the warmer temperatures. And then look what happened when you grew this at 86. Um, this might be similar to chrysanthemums. If you were to grow this crop at 77, you'd probably get relatively quick flowering, but once you start getting heat stress, um, you can see the crop shuts down and there's pretty big delay in flowering time. We did not look at differences between day and night. We know like poinsettias and chrysanthemums, you get the heat delay from a warm night temperature. 
we don't know if this delay in flowering is from warm night or day. Uh, we just looked at the average daily temperature. We've also done a lot of work uh, with Pan American on wave petunias. They've um, funded a lot of our research and they've had specific interest in quantifying flowering times uh, for the different wave varieties. So I'll talk about the scheduling program here in a minute, but we've categorized both the effects of temperature and light integral on flowering time. And you can see um, pretty big effects as you increase temperature from 54 all the way up to 75. Uh, as you get to these cooler temperatures, you begin to have pretty significant delays in flowering. So on our floriculture website, um, we have articles that we've published over the years, and there's a series of three articles that has specific crop timing. These are meant to be examples. Um, what we have here is days to first flower from transplant. So I have the little asterisk here because of course it depends on the crop, depends on the size it was grown, whether it was under long days or short days, um, what the light integral was. But this could be used as like benchmark timing if you don't have any information to begin with. More than likely, if it's not your first year of growing, you already have a pretty good idea how long crops take to flower. <clears throat> but you can see again, some of these crops uh, can flower relatively quickly at 63. So these would be crops that are considered to be fairly cold tolerant, things like calendula, um, some of the petunias, uh, and you can get even more significant flowering by growing them warm. And then you look at crops that really develop very slowly at 63, things like the gazanias, the geraniums, the pentas. Those are crops that really should be grown warmer if possible. Uh, last, before I get into our scheduling tools, um, I want to just mention PGRs. Again, these generally have an effect on flowering if we're using these at corrective rates or very late in production. So ideally, application of PGRs are something that should be planned in advance so that you're not having to react to a crop that's already gotten too big. Things to consider would be obviously the specific chemical what to rate and uh, what rate to use and how to use it. So is it a spray or a drench? Um, but also include a range. So here we have kind of like what would be done, but you probably also have a ballpark idea that, you know what, I'm not gonna use 10 parts regardless. I'm gonna think about what sort of year it's been, how is the plant growing off the bat, and then adjust that so that if, you know, you're not necessarily stuck on a certain rate that you wrote down. And for these vigorous crops, it's important to apply them early. So hitting them either just before transplant or perhaps a week after transplant is a good time to really uh, limit that initial growth spurt. And being a little bit proactive, knowing that, you know, if I don't hit something, get these crops, get something on these crops early, uh, I'm gonna have a battle ahead of me. What we wanna try to avoid are late drenches. If uh, they're going to be sold in those containers. So if you have like a 606 pack or a small container that you know a consumer is going to buy it and put it in their landscape, you don't want to use a late drench because what's going to happen to that for that consumer? Two months later, they're going to look out and that petunia looks like it's still in that four inch pot. Okay, The drench can have a relatively long residual effect and we don't want to have consumers have a negative experience by having a petunia that never grows out. So when possible, avoid late drenches. Now that can be good in some cases like a container or a, or a hanging basket, in which case a drench might be nice because the plant's not gonna get overgrown real quickly. The other thing is uh, to try to avoid late sprays because they have the most potential to delay flowering. So let's say that you have a petunia crop that's ready to go, but you can't ship it. It's tempting to apply a late spray that's probably fine if it's already in color, but if you need to ship it maybe a week or two from when you make the spray and you have to use a fairly high rate, that's when you can get some pretty significant delays in the flower bud development. So these would be cases where a late application might be better as a sprench, where you're getting some on the foliage, but you're also getting some of that to get into the uh, substrate as well without having a drench effect. In fact, I'm seeing more and more sprenches as kind of like the preferred application method of PGRs. 
Uh, this was developed, uh, well, we did a series of experiments um, with a colleague in Florida several years ago. Um, and so what we did is looked at just single applications. And again, it's kind of rare when you do a single application of a PGR, but we wanted to get some, some data. And this is, again, more for the grower that doesn't have much experience using paclobetrazol. Um, in this case, we used piccolo. It's a little bit hard to see. But these are the same plants, and this is 20 days after treatment or 30 days after treatment. And we used a single spray rate all the way from 25 to 100, which is getting up there, or a drench at two and a half or five parts. Um, and you can see the power of drenches is quite strong. You know, two and a half parts is a drench. One application of angelonia really, really uh, sat on it quite a bit. It also uh, had a very small effect on delaying flowering. But where we saw the biggest delay was when we had that single 100-part spray application. And then just another photograph. In this case, um, uh, we're looking at Petunia or the Angelonia, just comparing the sprays. Uh, and even 25 parts of the spray can get a pretty desirable result. But notice how as you increase the rate, you can see progressively later and later flowering. So this is... These are probably okay if you apply them really early. You just want to avoid it later in the latter couple weeks of the uh, production cycle. If you don't know what to use off the bat on an aggressive crop, we say th uh, five to eight, excuse me, five to eight parts for plants with moderate vigor, maybe 10 to 15 for more vigorous crops, but you'll have to do your own scheduling. You just want to make sure you don't go to extremes because of the effects on flowering time. Okay, so what are the major things we can do to slow crops down? Well, some of these are things that you have to kind of plan in advance. You really, once you are in a situation, there's only so much you can do. But let's say that <coughs> the last two years, uh, your crops are always in flower two weeks too early, okay? Well, one thing would be to transplant a smaller plug. Instead of getting a 2D8, start with a 512, okay? That can certainly add production time. Another is to lower the greenhouse temperature, especially at night. Or conversely, I shouldn't say or, this can also be important when you're ahead of time on scheduling or, or the crop's not shipping. This is the best thing to do is to slow down your crops is lower the temperature. If you have day neutral or long day plants, you could turn off the lighting so you're not getting earlier induction for the long day plants. <clears throat> if you're really desperate, you can pinch plants back. That's generally when you're in your last, you know, it's either pinch them or dump them because you have to add typically three or maybe even four weeks from the time you pinch them before they're in flower. Um, I've seen some really nice finished plants that have been pinched and are probably four weeks older than they meant, but they were still able to sell them versus dump them. Uh, alternatively, uh, growers have been playing around with floral and, uh, or collate as drenches um, or as sprays. Drenches you have to get the rates right, and it's actually, if you use the drench, it would be off-label. Um, but they can have an, some nice PGR effects, but they also can also have a small effect on flowering delay. <coughs> Sprays will have a bigger effect. In fact, at high rates, can abort all the flowers, so you have to be careful about that. And then again, if you intentionally want to delay flowering time, uh, paclobutazol or uniconazole, so things like bonsai and sumagic and piccolo, uh, those are crops where if you actually applied a heavy spray to those crops, you would see delays in flower development. What if you want to do the opposite and you need to ship and your plants are not in color? What can you do? Well, you can't start with a larger plug because it's probably too late, right? You've already transplanted. You're routinely behind scheduling. Then you can start with a larger plant. Um, or if you had not been buying or starting with plugs that were lit, you could start with a lighted plug. Increasing the temperature also is a relatively easy way to accelerate flowering. You'd want to increase both during the day and the night. Probably targeting the day more than the night, but the night temperature is still important. If you have the ability to provide high intensity lighting, or if you don't, but if there are ways you can increase the amount of light getting to plants, meaning a little bit wider spacing or cleaner glazing or something. If you're growing long day plants, provide long day conditions. This can have a big effect on flowering time, especially if you're finishing plants early in the spring or even late winter. And the last thing is, is to avoid the late sprays. 
and instead try to use low rate drenches or sprenches. Those have the less impact on any sort of flowering delay. So how do you get more scheduling information? Um, brokers and breeders will often have some information on their crops, although a lot of them actually don't have that much detailed information. They might say that your crop time is eight to 10 weeks at 60 to 70 degree night temperatures. Well, that's better than nothing, but sometimes we need to do a little more fine tuning than that. Um, there are universities such as Michigan State that put out magazine articles that contain research-based information and I'll refer to our website here in a minute because we have a bunch of those. Uh, we worked with Pan American to develop the Smart Wave Scheduling Program. Uh, then there's the Flowers on Time, which is a little bit of a different tool. Um, that's more useful for crops in which you have some experience with the crop already. And then the last one is Virtual Grower. Virtual Grower is a tool that's primarily used to predict energy consumption and how changing your structure or your glazing or perhaps uh, equipment or investments can influence your heating costs. But there's also a tab on there that has some scheduling information. And we continue to work with the developers of Virtual Grower to give them our crop data to incorporate that into the program. So what I'd like to do, um, actually, so here's the link for our floriculture website. I know a lot of you have already visited the site, but if you're looking specifically for information on scheduling of annuals, uh, these will have the tools and the categories of the different crops and the base temperatures. So if you need to sit on crops, you can know about how low you can go to shut them down, as well as the finished crop timing at different temperatures. Okay, so uh, here we have the wave scheduling. Um, this has been out, uh, I think, almost two years now. Uh, we, as I said, developed it with Pan American. Um, it's available on our floriculture website as well as Pan Am has it on their website. What I'd like to do is briefly go through it. And so what it's meant to do is provide you again with some baseline info about how temperature and light integral influence time from transplant to first flower of these dif different waves. So it's important that, you know, first of all, it's from transplant. And in this case, it's from 288 cell plugs. Okay, so if you're starting from a larger plug, You'll have to consider what effect that will have on your finish time. The other thing is, is until first flower. So if all, all you need is one flower on a plant, then that should be fine. But if you want to have more than one flower, like two or three per plant, you'd want to add on, you know, three or five days to that. So what you can do is run some simulations uh, and say, well, let's say I'm going to be growing these plants. Uh, well, let's see. So we have easy, easy wave petunia. Um, there is the white. And so let's just look at our example here. We had 72 degree temperature. So I'll change that to 72. And then our light integral. And some people will know where their DLI, others will not, but we can probably guess. If we're going to be transplanting uh, February 10th, do you have an idea of what your light integral might be? Maybe 10 moles in February? Pretty close. Good guess, at least. Um, and so what this would do is, in theory, I shouldn't say in theory. This is based on research, but <laughs> i got to have more confidence in my own stuff, you know? Well, it's just that there are so many things that can influence these scheduling, you know? Uh, if, a, if a plug got, you know, a drench too heavy early on or was not given long days. But given these little asterisks that we have here, I feel a little more confident because this is based on a couple replications of data. So that's saying it would take us 31 days. So I think you said about four weeks, roughly. So pretty close, pretty close. Um, the other thing is, is if you're under fairly high intensity sodium lamps, sometimes the heat from the lamps increases the temperature beyond the normal 72 air. So you might actually have a little bit warmer crop temperature, which might be similar to like, I mean, I can fudge these numbers a little bit, but you might be closer to a 74 plant temperature, which is, you know, two degrees would shave about four days off the time in that case. Okay. Um, so then the question is, let's say that you got your plugs in a week early. Okay. Uh, and for whatever reason, you wanted to transplant them because you got them and you didn't want to sit on them. So you could say, well, 
my DLI is not going to change, but what if I grow cooler? Uh, what if instead of 72, well, we'll say this, and let's say, you know what, instead I'm going to cool the greenhouse and go to 68. What's the effect on flowering time? So here you have 27 as you had before. Under the new conditions, you're at 39. So in this case, you're delaying flowering by 11 days. So it can help you make some decisions of what to do in the what if situation. Or, you know what, if you always have a hard time scheduling, you can try to use this to do a little more def defining of, of getting your crops in time. One of the things that um, Pan American was interested in was just to see how uniform the crops within a series were. And you can see there is some variability, and it'll be interesting to see if it fits with yours, but like you can see the easy wave whites tended to flower quicker than like the easy wave pinks. So there is some variability in the varieties um, and actually, we're planning to do some more research with them. Uh, in fact, we have the plugs we just received, so we'll be adding to this database to have more waves here in the, in the near term. Now, let me do one more simulation and say, okay, let's say that you wanted to turn your lights off. And again, we can just say, well, I'm going to, you know what, you were at 74. Let's say you're down to 72 if you turn your lights off. Your air temperature is the same, but your plant temperature is going to be a little cooler. And let's say you only had six moles of light. So what's the consequence only from a timing perspective? You can see here that, sorry, it's a little hard to see. You had 27 days here. Here you're delayed by eight days by turning the lights off effectively. Now that also doesn't consider the effect on quality. And that's something that's harder to quantify. Any questions on this Wave Smart Scheduling tool? Pretty straightforward. Okay, so then the other tool I'd like to show you is um, the flowers on time. And this is also a free program. Um, you can see the URL on your website, uh, on your uh, handout. And this is a, a program that um, we developed in collaboration with Paul Fisher at Florida and John Irwin at Minnesota. And what we did is we took all of our bedding plant data, John Irwin had some data, uh, as well as we found some published information showing the effects of temperature on cropping time. But instead of actually like trying to, because there's so many equations that affect crop timing, instead of trying to say, like the wave petunia, how many days to flower at this temperature in this DLI, we approach it as, okay, let's look at your typical production situation and how many days to flower at a certain temperature and then what are the effects of growing a little bit warmer or a little bit cooler on flowering time? So let's go ahead and use that easy wave variety if it is in here. So these are the four boxes in gray that you can change for your specific situation. What it'll then do is if, if we know it, it'll provide the base temperature as well as the optimum temperature. In some cases, it'll say NA because it was either not determined or not uh, published. There are actually some crops we've studied where you increase temperature and the plant keeps developing increasingly linearly up into the range we tested. In fact, impatience is an example where I think the warmest we grew it was constant 86 and they kept growing fast. We couldn't slow them down. We couldn't find a temperature that provided heat stress. So uh, what we can do is, is click here in this box and select the range of crops that we have most of these are bedding plants, but you'll also see some perennials and some potted flowering plants in here. So I don't remember which uh, wave petunias we have. Not too many in this one. So what we need to do is update this and add the wave petunia data. Well, classic wave is kind of another animal, isn't it? If I do the easy wave, what was that, coral reef? Okay, so um, let's go ahead and assume that the coral reef timing is the same as the white, even though there might be a you know, few days difference. Uh, let's assume that uh, finished temperature again is gonna be, seven, uh, let's see, our finished crop time, you said it was about 30 days or two weeks, maybe 28. And then that's at a production temperature of 72. 
and you had seven, well, you had 72. You were probably closer to 74 because you had all the lights and finish. And so here you can see that gives us the 28 days that you entered at 74, and then it'll predict what's the effect of growing two degrees cooler or four degrees or six degrees cooler or growing warmer. So this is more kind of like, you know what, I'm always three days ahead of schedule, or I want to slow these down by five days. You can look at some simulations about what would, how would that temperature have to change to affect the cropping time. Now the challenge is this is the temperature from transplant until finish. So then it's more of a challenge if you only have like a week to before ship and you have to get color on it or you're a week ahead, you have to get more extreme to try to push those values. And so that's when you're, when you're in those kind of situations, that's when it's good to pick up the phone and talk with us to see what sort of conditions you have so we can tell you how hard you can push them. So for example, I got a call just uh, this morning. This is a little bit different, but um, it was a cyclamen crop and uh, they transplanted them two, two weeks too late. They, well, they got the plugs in two weeks too late, so therefore they gave two weeks less long days so that they would finish on time because cyclamen's a short day crop. Well, if you don't give much, short, uh, much long days before short days, you get relatively a small plant because it induces, it would be kind of like going a poinsettia, transplanting and giving it short days right away, or, or a mum. Well, they had to do this to flower on time. Then the question is, they needed to get something taller because the plant's going to be too short. What can they do? Well, it's so late in the game that there's really not much they can do other than maybe apply a fascination or something. But in talking with, with a grower, it's good to talk about some of these certain situations so we can say, how far can you push the crop to really try to get your color? Um, there's the flower on time. Flowers on time, that's where you can download it. It's a floriculturealliance.org website, or we have a link from our floriculture website where to download it. Then just the virtual grower. Uh, development from by Jonathan Franz and Jennifer Bolt, as I mentioned, my, mainly used to predict energy consumption. Does enable you to do some some very simplistic scheduling of bedding plants. It's free at virtualgrower.net, and any day now they're going to come out with version 3.1 that's going to have some more information on crop timing as well as some other smaller features. Here's a list of the crop data. Um, you'll see a lot of similarities to what we've grown. You can add to it. It'll give you some generic information about the crop, if it has a long day response or not. Um, if we've, similar, if we've categorized the optimal temperature, or the base temperature will include that. And what it'll do is tell you, it, again, this would be um, very general, but if you wanted your crop in flower for a particular day at a particular temperature, it'll then count back on what day you should transplant it. But again, that would be situational depending upon the plug size and if it was a lighted plug and things like that. So I'd like to finish by acknowledging um, all the people at Michigan State that have contributed to this research, uh, former graduate students uh, and uh, technicians, as well as um, the funding that we get to make that happen. Private companies have contributed to this in fairly substantial ways as well. And we are able to leverage funding we get from growers to also obtain grants. Uh, through the USDA, from the American Floral Endowment, and from Michigan State's Project Green. So with that, um, here's our floriculture website one more time. It uh, has more information on sp specific topics, on lighting or bedding plants or temperature. It's there whenever you, you need it. You have now completed the webinar on crop scheduling of bedding plants. Now, please click the link below to complete a brief exit survey. By taking this exit survey, you are helping us collect essential data required by federal agencies. Thank you very much.